Welcome to Dead Head Space, now a part of the Silver Shamrock Horror Cast, a podcast network that includes Killing Time with Silver Shamrock and Unburying the Dead, where we exhume classic horror paperbacks for the new generation. We've got another giveaway. If you want a chance to win a free hardcover of Children of Chicago by Cena Palayo, then head on over to our Twitter. User handle is dead underscore headspace to get yourself entered in that giveaway. And this is a courtesy of Cena Palayo. She's kind enough to offer that. You can find us. <laughs> you can find this show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Ghana, and all other major platforms, which includes YouTube. That's right. You can now watch your favorite episodes, including this one, by searching for Dead Headspace. I'm your, I'm your host, Patrick R. McDonough, joined always by my co-host, Brennan LaFaro. Say hi, Brennan. Hello, everybody. And today we're joined by award-winning editor, Ellen Datlow. Say hi, Ellen. Hi. Hello. How <laughs> are you? This is... I'm good. <clears throat> I'm awaiting my, vac- my second vaccine for tomorrow, so... Oh, lucky I'm you. I'm a little that... nervous about that only because some people have reactions to the second one. So my I wife not anything for after. <laughs> my wife's a social worker, so she got uh, um, she got it early in Jersey. And uh, yeah, the second one, she, it knocked her out for a little while. Mm-hmm. Very tired, nauseous. So uh, we'd like to know what got you into horror? Well, I've always read it since I was a kid. Um, I was always reading science fiction and fantasy and horror, mostly short stories. I read Edgar Allan Poe and Nathaniel Hawthorne and then Ray Bradbury and H.P. Lovecraft. So I've actually always been into horror, although my early publishing experience was more in science fiction. As a fiction editor of Omni Magazine, Mm -hmm. I was mostly editing and buying and editing science fiction, but I always still loved horror. I wasn't supposed to buy horror for Omni, but later on I was able to. so I've, horror has always been something I've loved. Most more horror stories than novels. Okay. But I love horror fiction. Oh, and not is... as many movies. I don't go to that many horror movies. Mm. Actually. I mean, some I do, but I really like short fiction. That totally makes sense then why you, you pretty much exclusively edit for anthologies and uh, the best of now. Or... Well, I also acquire uh, short stories for tour.com science fiction and fantasy and horror. And I, <clears throat> from, no, from short stories from novellas for them. Hmm. You know. Brennan, and you want- for Night Fire too, which is the tour horror imprint. That's awesome. That's really exciting. I'm glad that tour did that. I, I got, me and Brennan were really excited when they uh, announced that last year. Yeah. yeah. Brennan, uh, why don't you go? Yeah, so uh, Ellen, whether it's horror or science fiction or any of the other, uh, genre fiction that you've worked with editing what it is what is it about the short story length that really appeals to you well for horror i do think that the short fiction length is the best the ideal length for horror um, because of that you can envelop an idea you can keep the atmosphere going in a short story while a supernatural horror novel is much harder i think to keep this to sustain the suspension of disbelief. <clears throat> so that's why I prefer horror short stories. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> as far as short fiction in general, I've been editing it so long, I don't have time to read that many novels. So, you know, really that's partly why, um, you know, I, I read a few and I read very little science fiction novels. I mean, the only science fiction novels I read religiously are Bill Gibson's. You know, I, I read all of his novels when they come out. And as far as fantasy, I read Jonathan Carroll's novels. And I, as far as crime slash supernatural, I read Liz Hand's Cass Neary novels. But mostly I don't have time to read novels because I'm working in short fiction all the time. I realize I'm in a rocking chair in my new apartment and I realize I rock all the time. I have to stop doing that. <clears throat> Eventually I'm getting a desk, but so far I'm, I'm not. I don't, and I have this rocking chair. So if you see me rocking all the time, tell me to stop. <laughs> 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 for YouTube, uh, for YouTube listeners who are wondering why Ellen keeps getting closer to the camera, then further from the camera, and then closer again. And I'm rocking back and forth in my <laughs> rocking chair. <laughs> what is it about uh, Bill Gibson's writing that attracts you so much? Oh to God! Well, I've been publishing him. I published his early stories in Omni, Demonic, mm. um, Hinterlands, uh, Burning Chrome. You know, most of his short fiction I published. So. 
I've always been a fan of his. And I started reading the first novel, Neuromancer, and I just love his novels. I think they're prescient, whether he intends them to be or not. Um, I think uh, agency, I loved the peripheral. I loved agency. The, I mean, his writing is just so clean. And I, I actually like the short chapters and the peripheral. I mean, it went so quickly. What happened is I read the book and I immediately reread it. Reread it. And I intended to do that with agency. Um, but I didn't have time to reread it. So, but it's just such fast reads and there's, they encompass so much and they're so political in there, but they, you know, every, all art is political, but his stuff, it's always been political. And it just is, it's the way he sees the world and creates his world building. Um, it's just so smooth. So there's a lot of things I love about his work. So just, this is relevant to, uh, him, but I, I really am attracted to technology and how it goes wrong or the, the little things. I love picking up on, you know, certain vocabulary. Um, I work. I, throwaway ideas. He's got more throwaway ideas in a page, you know, in, a, in three pages than most people have in a whole book. Sorry, go on. <laughs> oh, I was just going to say, I, I haven't heard of him before and I just looked him up while you were telling me um, and it, it just a real quick scan of his bibliography. And this totally looks like it's up my alley. Um, I, I got a degree in computer electronics. I, I was going to be going to school for computer engineer, but uh, life took me from New England to New Jersey when I met the uh, love of my life. So uh, I now work at a wastewater treatment plant and it's always always talking about different types of technology for control systems and um i don't know i just i scroll through his titles and it's all kind of it, it's things that attract me to a new author or uh, it's not continue fun. reading i mean it's not techie i mean it's there but it's embedded in the material and the content um you might want to start with his first novel which is dated now kind of neuromancer but <coughs> excuse me <coughs> but it's still fascinating for what he you know, just for what he started doing. And at that time he had, he wasn't even using a computer, he was using, he, I think he still used a typewriter, certainly for his stories and for- Really? So he was just not very computer literate and most of his technology is, it's research, you know, or made up. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. Brendan, you got anything on this uh, subject? Yeah, I'm, I'm putting the cart before the horse a little bit, but I'm wondering when you, you know, since we're talking about the little bit of time you get to read for pleasure. Do you have trouble turning the editing brain off when you do read for pleasure? Only if it, if I notice a sentence that's really bad. <laughs> I mean, when I'm reading a novel and, you know, I don't read short stories for pleasure, unfortunately. I mean, I do. I mean, I try to combine what I read for work with pleasure. But the novels I read, if I read a novel, you know, I read, I'm reading, I read some novels for the best of the year. And as I read, if I find, if I come across something that jumps out at me, is like, I don't know, this sentence doesn't make any sense. That <laughs> bad editing. Yeah, it jumps out at me, but hopefully I get so involved that I don't notice that much if it's, if it's you know, really involving. So overall, uh, as far as sci-fi goes, from the days of the uh, Omni magazine, have you noticed anything that sticks out as far as the evolution of science fiction? Is there anything that you're happy isn't as prevalent anymore or just in general, what are your observations of uh, sci-fi for the last few decades? Well, science fiction, to, first of all, it seemed very much done in the eighties and even early nineties were very much dominated, dominated by men, male writers. And then there were a bunch of, in the eighties when I was starting at Omni, uh, a bunch of female writers came into the field, Connie Willis, Nancy Kress, Kathleen Goonan, um, Octavia Butler, all these people who are writing science fiction. Um, what I've noticed in the last few years, and I, as I said, I don't read that much science fiction anymore, but it seems to me that it's less technology oriented, less future oriented and more, it's almost to me, science fantasy. It's not really science fiction anymore. I mean, there's much less actual <clears throat> science fiction that has to do with science and technology than it had in the past. Although, because I'm not keeping up in the novel area or even for the short fiction much. I mean, I get some short stories that are terrific and that are science fiction. Um, but I think a lot of it's gotten flattened into not actually what I would consider science fiction. 
Maybe that's why maybe people call it speculative fiction more. You know, in that's horror, it's a whole different thing. I mean, horror is, I mean, I don't know if you want me to talk about that. Love that, yeah, I mean, the absolutely. Horror thing, I mean, it's exploded with female writers and writers mm -hmm. from other countries and writers from other cultures. And I think science fiction, okay. Um, I think science fiction has had a lot more, there's a lot more science fiction and translation and horror in translation from other languages, so on. <clears throat> um, and it's become much more international. You know, there are writers from Africa, from Europe, from, from India and Pakistan, um, in both science fiction and horror, but because I read more horror, I'm noticing a lot, you know, there are a lot of people, um, I, I'm not sure, what do, you, what do you call someone who's British Indian? I mean, you know, someone who's oh. from the diaspora, I guess, I guess you'd say, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm I mean, I know sure the I'm wonderful writers, um, you know, Priya Sharma is um, British, but she's Indian, Indian British, but she grew up in, her ancestry is Indian, but she's British, okay? So I'm not, yeah. so I'm not sure what you call that. Aliette de Baudar is writing, she's mm. French um, Vietnamese. <coughs> Cassandra Kaur is living in Canada. She's from Malaysia, I believe. <clears throat> there are Filipino writers um, and they're writing some wonderful horror and science fiction, different ones. Mm. So to me, I see the explosion of female writers in horror, especially right now in the yeah. last five to eight years and a lot more um, writers coming in from other cultures. Yeah, and it's a different, and, and Jap there, I'm trying to think, there's some Japanese, well, there have been Japanese writers all along. I mean, um, Murakami, you know, the one up mm -hmm. Bird Chronicles. I mean, he's been writing science fiction and fantasy weird stuff for 20, 30 years. Um, but I see more of that all the time. Brendan, you want to take it away or you want me to? Do you think that, you know, uh, one aspect of what you were talking about with the worldliness of, um, both horror and science fiction, speculative fiction, if you will. Do you think a lot of that is down to social media? Yeah, well, email, elect, in the internet, not necessarily social media. The internet has made science, makes works and translation so much easier. You know, it used to be in the old days, there were things called IRCs, international Repl reply coupons that you would get from England and in Canada and Australia that you had to trade in for stamps. People who were sending stories from Australia, which you sent in print rather than email, you know, they would have to send printouts of their stories and they would have to send mailing things to, so we could mail them stories back or even a reply. So there were these coupons you would get, you go to the post office and they would give you stamps so you could mail back the, the uh, manuscripts or just a reply. The internet email has made that totally obsolete. And that's great because it means we, that's part of the reason why, yes, the internet and email has made it so much easier for people from other countries to, to contribute to wherever they, from wherever they are to America, um, let's say America to here, to America. But <clears throat> that's made a huge difference. Um, social media is a whole different thing as far as publicizing work, I think. But it was the email, it was the whole internet and being able to mail things cheaply, manuscripts as attachments and word files, mm. that made the difference, in my opinion. Yeah, I, uh, I know when my printer runs out of ink, I, I don't always have enough free cash because I got a kid or a house or whatever to go buy some ink cartridges. So I can't even imagine what it was like when you have a typewriter. Oh yeah, well, <laughs> right when you had a typewriter ribbon. For the oh. first few years when I started doing the best, the year's best fantasy and horror, mm -hmm. I typed those up. It was before I had a computer, and so I typed them up. I had to retype them, and I'm a terrible typist. Um, <laughs> and after maybe three years, I would start. Then I had a computer at work, but I didn't have one at home, so I would do the work in in the office. But before that, can you imagine you have to type up your summary of the year? <laughs> <coughs> and then and then you mail it of course and now I just email everything manuscripts Sorry. I used to have I used to have to pay um, my agent would send overseas um, submissions and I would have to pay for the postage 
and now in the last few years, no one takes print submissions. You know, you can send it, an anthology over by email. It costs nothing. So that's made things easier in that sense too. Do you find, so I, I you know, we talked about how you did the best of sci-fi. Uh, we haven't... No, horror, horror. I never did science fiction. Oh, I'm, my apologies. I thought you did it with sci-fi. I know you do it with horror. Uh, I did it with, um, the first one, the best, um, Year's Best Fantasy and Horror with Terry Windling. Although uh, I, never okay. did, I never did the fantasy. She did the fantasy, I always did the horror. But no, I never did a Year's Best Science Fiction. Okay, yeah, my apologies. That's what I was mixing it up with. Um, I, I was just going to ask if one's been more fun than the other, but you, you've been focusing on horror the whole time. <laughs> um, how, how does that feel, though? Because I see your productivity each year, and I don't know how I keep up with it. <laughs> <laughs> well, the best of the year is the hardest thing to do because it never stops. I yeah. never stop reading. I never have time. I'm finishing up number 13 now for 2020. Yikes. And I still have piles of stuff I have to look through. So, I mean, it's I get paid the little, the least and uh, work the most for that every year. So. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, I should put the mute on. I forget. I keep forgetting. I can do that. Oh, it's okay. Yeah. Brennan, take it away, no, sir. I, mean, I do it. I do it because I mean, every once in a while, I'm usually hit by burnout around now. You know, when mm -hmm. I'm picking it up, and I'm thinking, well, if I, I could, do, I don't have to do this. But then I think, but I want to keep my name out there. You know, it's like, and it's important, and I enjoy picking really great stories. You know, it's there's an upside, but the downside is like it take is very time consuming, and it doesn't pay anything, mm -hmm. <laughs> basically. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I know. Actually, not even the pay; it's the time consuming part that's tough. Yeah. Every, everyone I've talked to that's worked with you, they it's just they have a glow about them that I can tell you from what I've seen. It's just it means the world to those people, and it's real. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's just uh, you put it out there. You've worked your butt off, and people respect that. But I get the I get what you're saying because you got guys like Brian Keene too that in his book End of the Road talks about how it's so draining and whatnot. And uh, I, I mean, I get it. I don't know. That's not fun for anyone. Brennan, um, do you have a it's, segue? I, I was just going to say, yeah, it's draining, but unfortunately, yeah, you're, you, you kind of hit the nail on the head, Ellen. It's at 12 going on 13 that, you know, there's that following. And in addition to, you know, that kind of pressure you might put on yourself, you, you have that loyal following that just can't wait for next year's edition. <laughs> I don't believe that. I don't believe that. I mean, if I had that much of a following, I'd get more money for them. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, no, I love doing it. I, and I love bringing new writers to uh, the attention of the readership. I mean, you know, every year I'll say, these are, here are the writers who I've never heard. I've never published before any place. And a few of them I'd never even heard of sometimes. So, you know, I, I really am happy about that, that I can bring new voices, you know, to the fore. Hmm. Uh, that, that brings up a good point is uh, for newer writers, how can someone get on your radar? For the best, both basically to be in something that'll look at the best of the year. Okay. I mean, that's because I try to read everything, I, or at least skim everything I possibly can that's out there that may have horror in it. Mm -hmm. um, if I see then a name over and over again, <clears throat> I start recognizing the name and looking forward to their stories. And I may approach them. I'm in fact, I just read a few stories by someone. I realized I've been appreciating the person's writing for a while. And I'm thinking, should I ask that person for a story at one point, some point for an original? I don't know. You know, I mean, you take me a chance. It's no big deal. I mean, but you, you know, also you don't want to disappoint the person if you turn it down. Right. <laughs> you know, just listening for an anthology or something. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but sometimes I do find, you know, I'll find writers who I will start asking for stories for original things because I love their work. I'm starting to really appreciate their work. So basically to get on my radar, be published in a place that's respectable, mm -hmm. that I'll see. <clears throat> if, I mean, some people just do destined to get published any place. And that's not necessarily a good thing. Because mm -hmm. uh, sometimes if, it, if it's in an anthology that gets no press that no one knows about that no one that is not good if it's got really very mediocre stories it's not going to get 
you any place. Mm. I mean, yes, maybe your your one story is brilliant and it will shine, and that's good. But in, it's better to try to go with venues that are respected and that readers will be know about. You know. Yeah, um, that was a that was definitely. <laughs> Uh, a learning experience for me when I started out that, uh, you know, what is it? You don't get paid, you get um, represent. Oh, yeah. no, no rep love or copies, contributor copies. Th that's it. Yeah. yeah. And uh, <laughs> well, you have to pay for your contributor copy. Don't, <laughs> don't, no. Yeah. Um, those are definitely big red flags right there. Yeah. If you have to pay or I see it come up every now and then where a new writer asks about, um, how much they should pay their publisher and vanity presses. No, 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 no. You never pay your publisher. <laughs> That's a big no, no. Um, no, there are red flags. And I, um, there, I have something else that I thought of when you were saying that. I don't remember why. It didn't come to me. I'm going to get on to, I'm, I'm real interested with this. So before I jump to another subject, Brennan, did I cut you off a, like 30 seconds ago well sort of no i i actually uh ellen you mentioned something a few minutes ago that i wanted to circle back to real quick you you were talking about how there's this big surge of women in the last i think you said like five to eight years or so um in both science fiction and horror i wonder if you'd speculate on why on why that <laughs> is um i'm not actually sure why i haven't even thought of it um <clears throat> I mean, there have always been women writers who are doing science fiction and horror. And there are definitely, I think it's a new generation, <coughs> maybe because their writing workshops have been encouraging them. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's possible. Um, I've been teaching, I teach Clarion West about every five years. Um, I'm not actually sure. <laughs> Oh, that's unfair. I, I, actually I, actually had, I hadn't thought about it. I mean, I don't know why. And I, I, it's a discussion I need to have with women writers. Mm. I was just wondering if you had any kind of speculation, because I mean, it's I, I I'm relatively new to the, uh, you know, smaller independent side of of horror. And it's, you know, at the traditional I only get my books at, you know, Barnes and Noble. It is the, the women, the women's subsets definitely smaller. And a lot of the brilliant writers that I've discovered are, you know, being published through small press. And I was just wondering if you had any insight into, you know, is the, is the landscape changing? How is the landscape? Why is the landscape changing? But again, I didn't mean to just throw you on the spot there. No, no, it's all right. It's a good thing. Um, there are more markets for different kinds of fiction, horror fiction. Um, there are more novella markets. And I think, uh, you know, as far as women coming, I'm not sure, I don't know. I mean, I could name, you know, 20, 30 women off the, you know, off the top of my head who, who I wasn't familiar with maybe five years ago who are writing terrific stories. I mean, as I, you know, it's, uh, I'm mostly a story person, a short fiction person. Um, I don't read that many novels, but so, you know, it's like, but I can tell you, you know, you can just see from my table of contents. I mean, for years, it was like I'd have maybe four or five women out of all the men in the best of the year. Or even years best fantasy and horror. Terry did the fantasy and so did, and then Kelly Link and Gavin Grant. I always did the horror. Now, it seemed to come out about even, but it was because most of the fantasy was by women and most of the horror was by men. But mo my half always was overpowered by men. And up until a few years, you know, maybe I, I, I actually did a count. I mean, I, I haven't lately, I don't remember, but I went through my, you know, 12, first 12 volumes of the best horror of the year. And over the years, I've, you know, I, the, the parody has changed. It's been definitely evening out. And this year so far, I have more women. I mean, I haven't picked all the stories yet, but I have more women than men in the table of contents, which is interesting to me, that never happened. But I mean, I don't, it's not, it may not end up that way. So, I mean, I, that's how I know I'm aware. I'm a, that's why I'm aware there, there's so many more women because I'm seeing them, their work in short fiction. 
mm. all over the place and it's really fine. But no, actually that would be an, I have to do, I, that's a panel that I need to do with some women horror writers. It's like, where did you all come from? <laughs> where did this happen? Why did it, I, it's, I can't believe I, you know, I never really, um, I'm glad to put me in this spot because I don't know. <laughs> I should know. It's something I should know or would like to know. They're, they're taking over and, you know, given the quality, I am absolutely okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 I have a, an anthology coming out, um, Body Shocks in the fall. It's a reprint uh, body horror, extreme body, ho body horror. <clears throat> and I've never, I've not ever been a total, I never thought I was a fan of body horror. I mean, I don't really like what is called, referred to as extreme horror, but I found a lot of stories. I mean, that one's mixed. I don't remember the percentage of men to women, um, but I found a lot of great stories that, you know, that to me are not extreme. I mean, I don't think they are, but they're definitely body horror and, you know, provocative <laughs> and shocking in some ways. <clears throat> so it'll be interesting how, you know, how people react. I don't know if it'll be hardcore enough for the hardcore male audience <laughs> of that type of work and or, or too hardcore for my, the audience that I usually get, which is, um, I mean, it's not like I, I publish a lot of quiet horror, but not only, I mean, I'm, I'm into uh, all kinds of horror. Yeah, you know, I like the visceral as much as I like the subtle, you know, I'm happy to hit you over the head sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to switch gears over to a, a topic that we briefly mentioned, which is politics and fiction. Um, I'm just going to jump to a specific question first. So you're super vocal on Twitter. I love it. I'm, you know, I, I'm right there with you with what you have to say. And <coughs> the I orange. Offensive. <laughs> well, I like it. I'm just wondering what you think will come out of the Trump presidency and especially the inauguration. What kind of fiction? Oh, fiction? Up? Yeah. What about the pandemic? I mean, you know, I've already saw a story about the pandemic. Um, so that's a good it, it, It's what's going to come at it. It's hard to say. There are a lot of people who do heavy. I hate heavy handed politics. I mean, as I said, every, every piece of art is political in some way or another. Um, but I hate pedantic fiction. I will not read it. I find it boring. So basically you embed your point of view in the story and tell a good story and you can put whatever politics you want in it. Mm -hmm. um, and hopefully the reader will appreciate the storytelling and will get the politics without you hammering them over the head. Um, I don't know. I just watched, oh, I just rewatched The Dead Zone last night, which I hadn't seen since it came out, which is really interesting. But I know people are saying, oh, you know, John, um, uh, what Greg, whatever his name was, is supposed to be. <clears throat> I mean, he's like a prototype, prototypical Trump, I guess, maybe. But, I, you know, I, I didn't think he was that bad. It's like, I mean, he didn't say anything to me. I mean, on the in the movie, he didn't seem, I think, what is it, Greg Stilton or something like that? I forget. What, did you have his Greg, yeah, Gre Greg Stilton. I mean, he didn't seem it. that bad. Although, I mean, obviously, when Johnny touched his hand, he saw the apocalypse. That's different. I mean, he was crazy. But he didn't seem that any more awful than any politician I've seen in the last 30 <laughs> years. It's like, well, he's not so bad. You know, he's just, you know, what are the other people promising, you know? <laughs> I mean, except he did beat up an opponent, opponent but that's different. <clears throat> um, what will come out of it all? Well, what came out of 9-11? When I first, um, the first stories, I, I, the first 9-11 story I think I got was by Lucia Shepard. And it was a really fine story, but it was way too early for me to be able to want to publish it. Mm. And it did get published um, a few months later. And, but the first, the, the, pub, the story I published in by fiction, <clears throat> was a, There's a Hole in This City by Rick Bowes, which is about New York and about the hole in the city that, 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 created um, metaphorically and literally. And um, you're not getting that much, you never got that, there was not that much fiction about that. 
really. I mean, about the event, you know, it's what the repercussions are politically and how we've changed, unfortunately, as a nation from that, you know, with overly being paranoid and anti-Muslim, you know, uh, <clears throat> actions. And um, so that's, I don't know what's going to come out. You know, I'm, I'm not a trend predictor. I've never been able to predict trends. People will write really bad stories about it, using it, and people will write good stories that will just, that'll be embedded in the, if they're talking about the past. I mean, the thing is, don't forget, was the, your, people are writing fiction. It's imaginary worlds, but it's going to be hard to avoid certain things. It's going to be hard to avoid the fact that there was a pandemic here and like for a year, we've been a year and a half for lockdown. That you know, you, you know, how are you going? You either have to skip over it or deal with it in your fiction if you're writing a realistic story. Yeah. So um, I think writers have to learn. You know, it took years before good, really great Vietnam War novels came about. Right. You know, whenever you the, a country or there's trauma, it's going to take a while for, to be digested. Initially, you might get these angry overtly political stories that may or may not work. And eventually they'll be, I don't want to say not homogenized, but they'll be digested by the art and or not by the right, by people who lived it. And they'll come out hopefully beautiful or interesting, provocative fiction. Mm. You know, there's no way of knowing what's, you know, who's going to write what kind of great story about it and how they're gonna approach it. But I personally don't like heavy handedness and pedantic fiction of any kind. Oh, that's fair. Brilliant. Yeah, and what, what, you know, what jumped out at me right away was, uh, you know, you just, you repeated it. The, the term heavy handed was one of the first terms you used early on. And that's definitely something to be uh, avoided. You know, you can write in response to uh, situations, whether they be this administration that just left office or, 9-11 um, in very, you know, thematic ways, you know, you can, you can write a response to um, the, the um, insurrection on, on January 6th, mm -hmm. you, you know, you can write a cult horror story, mm -hmm. uh, you can write story, stories of power imbalances and um, making up, you know, lies that are believed by millions and the repercussions of that. Um, and if you lean into those themes, you know, there's a million great stories you can write, you can write that don't, don't go so, um, that don't pinpoint so, uh, a, yeah. Yeah. I mean, even really great writers can have missteps. I mean, I think there's one story I read by <clears throat> a submission years ago when I was Omni by um, <clears throat> James Tiptree Jr. When she had got, when she went by, she was, she used her real name at the, by the end, <clears throat> excuse me. It was a story about fundamentalism, fundamentalist, and it was just, I hated it, I hated it. I mean, it's called morality meat, and basically the fundamentals eat babies. <clears throat> I mean, it was so obvious, it was so like, are you kidding me? I mean, give it a break, you know? I may not like fundamentalists, but it's like making them cannibals, excuse me, you know? It's like, come on. I mean, on, on the other hand, talking about eating babies. <laughs> Dale Bailey wrote a terrific story called um, a couple of years ago called um, um, oh God The Donner Party. Okay, but it's not that Donner Party. <laughs> it's the Donner Party. It's an alternate universe, like kind of in a Victorian time. And it's the Donners and they're having a cocktail party. <clears throat> and that is a satire and it's ugly and it's powerful and it's terrific. And it's about, it's not about fundamentalists, but it, you know, it uses those, that horrific kind of image <clears throat> to good effect. So, you know, it depends on how you do it. It's always gonna depend on how you do it. How, how you create art out of ugliness. Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll go on record and say, I, I submitted a story uh, to a publication just this morning that was my response to the events of January 6th. And I am hopeful that, you know, I wrote it in a way that's layered enough that if you want to see the similarities, they're there. And if you don't 
then it's and it, it's a story that stands on its own and you know uh completely separate but you know of course i'll let you know when i get my rejection so <laughs> and if they know it you know <laughs> yeah exactly and, no, that's important i mean that you know yeah you can write about what you're passionate about and angry about but disguise it yep in a way and not disguise it but mutate it i mean you know make it into something else into something that it's not about that it's part of the history it's part of what is there but it's not about that you know like i don't want to read stories about 9 11 i don't want to read stories i mean well that's you know on the other hand you do want to read stories now about 9 11 maybe maybe but something else has to be going on that can't be the central incident you know that's part of a story you're missing the the through line of the storytelling the plot you know it's like cyberpunk you things used to be cyberpunk and then it just became furniture which is fine you know okay this is the world that was created but now do something with it mm -hmm. can't just have the world here you know that's nice but now what are you going to do with it what's your what's going on here what's the point so yeah with anything i hope that makes sense <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no <laughs> Now, Pat Patrick mentioned uh, that, you know, you have your views and you don't feel the need to uh, keep them to yourself, which, again, well, we love. I sometimes I do. Okay. I know what they are. <laughs> you don't always keep, feel the need to keep them to yourself. Now, <laughs> uh, obviously, you've worked with uh, a, a ton of different authors over the years with, you know, as many different viewpoints as there are authors. Well, some of them you... also. I mean, over time, I mean, I'm not going to name names, but <laughs> no, seriously. Yeah, there are people who I was friendly with, I was close to writers and um, published some of the really good best stories. And then they changed personally into people who I'm not particularly want to hang out with or no. Mm. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but. No, 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 that's, <laughs> a, that's okay. That's kind of part of the answer actually. Um, but the, um, I guess where I was going with that is, do you ever find stories that really gear towards a particular way and you have trouble keeping your, you know, personality, I guess, out of, out of the editing um, when you're when trying I, to well, kind of, sorry, go on. I was going to say when you're trying to just make, help that person make the story the best it can be. Oh, well, that's different. Okay. Now there are stories that I may think are good that I just maybe are just not for me. I just don't like them, but it doesn't mean they're bad. Okay. But if you're saying, am I going to, if I want to buy a story or if I like a story enough to work on it, since I'm not a writer, I don't have as much of a an impulse to change a writer's work as a writer editor might. Um, I try to be mindful of what the writer is trying to do and i will ask questions i mean if i'm not sure what's going on i'm not sure what the point is i will ask i will ask the writer what do you mean by this is this what you mean what's going on here <clears throat> and i will try not to impinge on their um what they're trying to do i try to help them make it better you know i mean you know i may have an opinion and oh if you did that you know, this is what I would like to happen, but I'm not going to make them do it. It's like only because I don't, I like the character. Don't kill that person. <laughs> Please don't kill that person. And yeah, Stephen Graham Jones is, he was going to write something. He was writing something. Who did it? Wait, he was talking about, I don't remember what, just a few days ago. And he said, it was, I think it was him. And he was saying something about, no, maybe it wasn't him. Well, whoever it was. Oh, I know. It was Laird Barron's writing a story for me. And he said, no, oh, kill animals, people, blah, blah. I said, you can kill anything, but don't kill animals. Please don't. <laughs> he, no, it's like he got, he got trashed. Well, no. He read for KGB or virtual KGB a few months ago, and he, a dog died in the story. You know? I mean, in what he read. In the and someone got really upset. It's like, sorry. <laughs> it's a horror story, guys. You know? <laughs> Um, I mean, he doesn't show, he wasn't graphically showing the animal dying or anything or being killed even. Um, but yeah, you know, it's like, no, I'm not, I mean, I don't mean it. I was kidding. You know, it's like, if he, if he needs to kill the animal, kill the animal, but I'd rather he not. <laughs> just because personally, I hate to see animals suffer. I'd rather, it's terrible, I guess, but I'd rather see a person suffer than an animal. 
because uh, that's the fair. Animals, <laughs> animals are totally innocent. They, they're totally innocent. Mm -hmm. They know not. They have no agency. I guess is a good word. Oh, absolutely. Um, speaking of Stephen Gray, my cat bites me all the time, and I smack him. <laughs> <laughs> you know, jerk. He's not here right now. I, I just finished uh, Stephen Graham Jones. This is the only good Indian audiobook last week, and I loved the shout out he made to you. Oh, that was really, I was like shocked. That was really that, cool. That, for, that was really very humbling. Now, yeah. please correct me if I'm wrong, but he said in a paraphrase that the book would not have happened without Alan Dattler, without you. I don't know why he said that. <laughs> I mean, I did read the book. I read it in manuscript, um, and I we read it for tour, and mm -hmm. we ended up not taking it. Um, um, I'm not sure why he said that, but I mean, I appreciate it, of course. You know, I mean, I've worked with him a lot, but he mm -hmm. was he was he was established before I got a hold of him. You know, <laughs> I mean, I've been publishing his stories for the last maybe I, what are, his, the first story I ever took by him was Raphael as a reprint for one of the best of the year, maybe hmm. or two, I don't remember. I can't remember. <clears throat> so I've only really been aware of his work for like 10 years. Oh, okay. I don't think I've read his early novels. Um, I love Mongrels. I did read that. But his shorts, you know, I've read a lot of his short stories since I've been, you know, since I became aware of him and publishing a bunch either originally or reprints. I've only been aware of him for two years, but because um, I'm I'm newer to this, how's it been like to see his career evolve into what it is now? Oh, I'm really pleased. It's great. It's, I think it's terrific. It's really. I mean, he's very I'm humble. So, I'm so happy for him. Yeah. That's great. <clears throat> Why did you? Um, I don't mean to, this might be offensive and it's not supposed to, but why did you only stick to writing, editing as opposed to writing? Because I have nothing to write about. Okay. Because <laughs> you know? it's, because I. Different brain parts. Okay. <clears throat> like I can, I'm really good at, I'm, I could not create art, but I'm really good at photography. You know, I can find things and I just have nothing to write about. Simple as that. I have no. I found my old journals. Um, I started rereading them a few uh, before I moved. Now, since I moved, I haven't had a chance to read uh, read them. But from like 60, oh, 67, and around then. And I, I <clears throat> in college, I wrote some really bad po poetry. I mean, really bad poetry. <laughs> but, it was, but actually, one wasn't that bad. I was shocked. You know, I would never do anything with them. But no, I was never. I never wanted to be a writer. I mean, I never. I, and I fell into editing because I didn't know what else I would do as a reader, what I would want, what I would do with my life, basically. What was, um, well, I mean, you clearly are good at it and made a hell of a career out of it. What did, um, what was Omni the first job that you had or? No, I started working in book publishing um, okay. in uh, about 73 or four as an editor. First, my first job in book publishing was the Little Brown and Company, which had a New York, has well, I don't know if they still do, but it had a New York office <clears throat> and I was hired as sales secretary. That was the first publishing job I got. Hmm. Um, I mean, I when I I got an English lit degree, I knew I didn't want to be a teacher. My mom was a teacher. She said, oh, I should be a teacher. I was like, no. <laughs> and I thought, well, what can I do, you know, with an lit, English lit, library, bookstore, publishing? I like going to bookstores. Luckily, I didn't, I think I'm glad I didn't go into bookstore employee because I would have made no money at all ever <laughs> <laughs> I really I can't imagine being into library I mean I worked in the library at my college but you know um but I didn't really know what publishing even meant mm -hmm. I didn't even know what editing meant I mean and, and a lot and editing actually is something you, you learn a lot on the job but my first and I said my first publishing job was at Little Brown and I worked there for few months about six months or nine months maybe um a sales secretary to the new york salesman then i found a job some of my one of my um one of my fellow employees there um suggested that i go to try apply for a job in another house another publishing house so i got a job as an editorial assistant 
And I got several jobs as editorial assistants. I said I got nowhere slowly <laughs> um, in book publishing. I mean, I was uh, actually, it seemed like a lot longer than it was, but I think I was in book publishing between around 73 and 78. So it seemed like forever. Um, and I didn't really get, and I was in trade book publishing, which means regular publishing rather than academic. <clears throat> and I was in mainstream. I wasn't in genre publishing. Mm. The longest job I had was at Holt Reinhardt and Winston for three years. So Excellent. Omni was the first magazine job I had though. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Have you been in New York your whole life? I grew up, actually I grew up in the Bronx till I was eight. Mm -hmm. I moved to Yonkers when I was eight and I lived there until I went to college in Albany. And I've been living in Manhattan since about 19, oh, after college. I graduated in 71, went to Europe for a year. Around 73, I moved to Manhattan. So I've been living in Manhattan ever since. Okay. Um, this is kind of not a good segue, but back to, <laughs> I meant to say with the Little Brown uh, company is, um, I wish I knew her name when she worked there, but my uncle's wife's sister, my aunt who married into the family. In the New uh, York she, or, the, or the Boston? Oh, if she was in the I, New York office, I might have known her. I assumed it was New York, but I didn't know there was a Boston branch. The Boston branch is the main one. New York was just a small office. Okay. And also, well, it depends on when she was there. I was only there for, you know, like 70s three to 74 or something. I completely forgot about her until you brought up Little Brown because I don't hear anyone talking about that company, um, at least recently. And well, um, the, thing, the thing about book publishing that people don't talk about, um, it's very classist. I mean, it oh. used to be probably more, much more than maybe still now, I'm sure it is, but back in the seventies, it was totally classist. You couldn't get anywhere if you weren't an Ivy League or. Really? Uh -huh. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I didn't realize it at the time, <clears throat> but, you know, looking back, I can see, you know, what was going on. I mean, a lot of the places I worked, I only worked for like six months, three months. I had very bad luck. Hmm. Um, I th initially, I had good luck. I got this job as editorial assistant. <clears throat> I loved my boss. She was great. She was a great mentor. But it turned out the imprint was shutting down in six months. <laughs> Oh, which no. meant I no longer would have a job, except yeah. I, was, I was able to have a job at the bigger company, David McCain Company, and I worked for the uh, executive editor for a while. Then, 1975, I came down with pneumonia. I ended up in the hospital. My boyfriend broke up with me. No, actually, we got together then when I got when the, in the hospital. We, I, we had broken up. I guess I broke up with him anyway. My former roommate died in a plane crash. Oh. And I lost my job. I mean, my mom comes in and says, oh, it looks like there's been a walkout. Your company, your boss, I, I, but I think you're okay. And I'm like, no, my boss and his boss has just walked out. I have no job. <laughs> you know? um, so um, I was on un unemployment for a while after I got out of the hospital. Um, and then I worked for Arbor House, which was run by a crazy person named Don Fine, who was, had a terrible reputation. <clears throat> I had... When I was unemployed, I had, people said, don't, you don't want to work for him. You don't want to work for him. Finally, I was desperate. I think I was out of unemployment and I had to do something. So I went and I worked for him and he was a monster. Mm -hmm. <laughs> However, while I <clears throat> was miserable, <clears throat> I mean, he would, he's the kind of person who twice a year, and I'm not kidding and I'm not exaggerating, neighbors in the hall, in the companies next door, mm -hmm. you know, it was like a big office building, they complained twice a year approximately that he, they could hear him cursing out his employees. Oh my God. Disturbing them. Yeah. I mean, he would turn in a dime. He'd be really nice. And then he just would, he was a drunk too, but he was also brilliant. <laughs> you know? I wouldn't have been able to, you know, run this company for a while. Uh, anyway, so I worked for him. I'm one of the few people who didn't run out crying or screaming. I actually resigned and gave him two weeks notice so I could yell back. But anyway, I only worked for him like four <laughs> months. And then I worked for Crown. So, but all this, you know, these four jobs were like only in about four or five years. You know, and then I, oh, <clears throat> oh, sorry. After Arbor House was, um, that's when I went to Holt for three years. And actually I, I loved Holt and I loved working there and I liked my boss a lot. 
And it wasn't until later I realized, I mean, I was not, <clears throat> my boss who was from Yale did not help me. I mean, he just, it, I, I just said it was a class thing. I mean, I'm sure he wasn't even aware of it, but um, so I didn't get anywhere there. And finally I quit that because I just could see I wasn't getting anywhere. So, um, and then my last job in book publishing was a crown and it was five. Mm. It was the first time I think, first time I was fired from a publishing job, let's put it that way. Um, and then, but you know, within a year or so, that's when Omni started up and I found out about it from someone who I worked with at Holt and I started working at Omni. So, hmm. and that was the first uh, magazine job I ever had at Omni. Were there many women workers in general at any of those early publishing oh, houses? Plenty of women. Uh, yeah. I mean, at, in Little Brown, it was a very small office. I mean, there's only like 10 people in the office. Oh, wow. I mean, you know, it was a branch. It was the main office, they said, was in Boston. Mm -hmm. And um, and the, let's see, the publicist, sub rights person, they were both women. And um, now I don't know if they were head of sub rights or not for the whole company. I mean, I, I realize I have no idea, you know, but they were pretty powerful. And uh, there was an editor, two editors who worked there. The three editors, a New York editor, um, is someone who's become a best-selling author. Very interesting, but that's besides the point. <clears throat> um, so, I mean, there were powerful women there, and then I worked with this powerful woman who then closed the imprint closed. There were women. Um, there was a cadre of powerful women at that point uh, who I knew their names. You know, I never knew most of them. Maybe I met them. So there were powerful women in book publishing then. There were some powerful ones. Um, but as, so I said it was less sexism than classism. Oh, okay. That I experienced anyway. Yeah. And I worked with some really horrible people. <laughs> that sounds horrible. That does sound horrible. I, you know, when you were talking about the whole classes thing, kind of makes me wonder if guys like uh, Tolkien and um, C.S. Lewis would have been anything if they weren't Ivy League, you know, uh, Ivy School professors. Yeah, it's, I, I don't know. I mean, it's a different, don't forget that's also was England. So that's, yeah. that's a whole different class system. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Wait, um, yeah. Yeah, and, but now, and then that was mainstream book publishing. That was not genre book publishing. Mm -hmm. Now, genre, initially, I did not want to get to genre pu book publishing. I did not want to be pigeonholed. And also, at the time, most of the novels were being published in, as serials in magazines first and then became books. So no one, they were not edited as books. They were edited as, you know, when they were in the magazines. And I wanted to be an editor, whatever that meant. I mean, I don't even remember how I found out what editing actually meant. It was something I learned on the job. And that was one good thing, the horrible place I worked. I started as um, answering the phones and within like two, like, but then <clears throat> within a few weeks, everyone between me and the boss disappeared. You know? <laughs> so I worked publicity, I did some sub rights and I even edited a book. I edited a novel. You know? <laughs> So, um, you know, I was kind of learning on the job. <laughs> Do you remember what that novel was? It was a historical um, by someone named Bella something. I can't remember her name. I think she's dead now. Um, I don't remember. I mean, I could look it up. I could probably figure it out. <laughs> it doesn't matter. I mean, it was uh, something I would never read on my own. <laughs> okay. Seriously, I wasn't into <laughs> historicals, you know. Mm-hmm. Brenda, what you got, man? Well, I was I was wondering, you know, combining your uh, kind of learning by the seat of your pants, if that's fair to say, with what you've learned since then, what advice would you give to somebody who wants to get into that field? To be an editor? Yeah. <clears throat> Read slush. Learn, I mean, that's really helpful um, to read slush. You know, it as a writer also, just to see what's out there and what mistakes people are making. You can tell, you can start telling the difference between something good and something bad or something good and something medi mediocre and something that really jumps out at you. And it's like, wow, you can tell the, the difference at a certain point. <clears throat> so I think that's helpful if you can do that, if you can get a job. Um, I mean, 
people unfortunately don't pay much for slush reading if at all. At the time, when I was at Little Brown, I was sales secretary and I was, and the reason I was sales secretary, the former one was promoted to manuscript reader. I mean, they actually had a devoted person, one person reading manuscripts, submissions, unagented. That is unheard of. <laughs> they paid someone to do that. And she was overwhelmed, so she gave me some manuscripts to read too. These are novels, not stories, okay? Mm. So um, <clears throat> learning, that's, I mean, that's really helpful to see what's out there, kind of to read slush piles. <clears throat> First time I heard that advice was from Leah Barron on a different podcast. That's uh, that's really good advice. I've I've read Slush for um, a review platform, and uh, yeah, you start seeing things that jump out at you pretty quick. I did one for a flash fiction contest, and uh, right away I was starting. My brain was starting to say like, "Well, they're trying to achieve a a bigger story here than the what the thousand words allows, and it's not focusing." on one thing so you're losing track and you're not your punches aren't landed basically mm -hmm. that's fantastic advice <laughs> yeah you learn a lot from reading slush yeah. oh abso absolutely but i mean there's not really i don't think anyone can teach you how to edit the only teaching the only instruction i got <laughs> when i started at omni um ben bova was a fiction editor and he had me come in he had me, he aligned edit this, the first two pages of the story. I didn't know what I was doing. I mean, I guess I, you know, I made, and he, he, what he did, he sat me down and said, why did you do that? Why did you do that? Why did you do that? And I had to explain it to him. And that's the only instruction I ever got. Um, you know, so it's something you do learn on the job. And, you, and I, I learn, I, now I learn, I still learn, you know, from every piece I edit. You know, it's funny because Ed Bryant used to, challenge me when I he was he was a pain in the neck to edit because I would edit something he said why and it's like I had to but he made me think it's like okay this is why <clears throat> because it doesn't work for, for this reason or that reason you know and so you know I, I do have writers who challenge me on I mean I, I also say it's like this is not unless I really hate something it's not the law you know if I I think I had one disagreement a major disagreement and it was just about a line I think with someone who I've worked with a lot. And he said, I don't get it. I said, no, there's nothing wrong with that. And I said, yes, this makes no sense. And he said, no, it does. And I said, it doesn't, you know, and like if it doesn't, sometimes I'll say, if it's not terrible, I'll say, okay, I'll let it go, but the copy editor checks it, then we'll revisit this. And he, sometimes the copy editor said, oh, what's going on here or something. I mean, usually a copy editor doesn't do that much work, but, <clears throat> They, I mean, they mostly do uh, more punctuation and overuse of words and things, but they don't usually question um, clarity, you know, <clears throat> at least not for anthologies. I mean, I have a very good copy editor, uh, work with the tour.com who is extremely picky, but is really good. Mm. I'm, I don't mind her pickiness because I can say, I can say, <clears throat> but I'm glad she asked. <laughs> it's like, oh my God, how did I miss all that? You know, sometimes I miss it and, the, you know, and I'm not paying attention. Line editing is very close editing. And I have to really focus and you have to forget the, to read the story and get involved in it again. Because <clears throat> you're not able to focus on the line by line rhythm of it or even the words in it. You know, so, so having, having a really good copy editor is very useful. But then there are copy editors that over copy edit and it's just wrong, you know, just like, oh God, leave me alone, stop it. No, stead everything. <laughs> I don't know of, I could be wrong, but I, I haven't really heard of a whole lot of independent publishers that have several different types of editors. That's just like one that does it all. Well, doesn't the person edit, what you mean for novels or for stories or both? Oh, um, I, I just meant for, novels, stories, really everything. Well, someone who hopefully is editing this, who's doing a line edit, I mean, an edit, an overall, su a substantive and line edit is usually done by the same person, the editor. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah, that's what. It would be a different person than a proofreader, hopefully, you get is a different person, if you, hopefully. Right, hmm, okay. Um, Brennan? 
I, I was going to ask you, you know, you, you mentioned that editing is not necessarily something you can learn. Um, well, you know, and, and we're talking more on the global scale rather than line edits. Um, what would you say uh, characteristics, traits, what, what makes somebody good at it? Um, <clears throat> first of all, you don't, you can't want to rewrite the person's work. That is not your job. <clears throat> and if you're doing that, you're a bad editor, you know, seriously. I mean, the, yeah. the writer should be rewriting their work. You should not, I mean, you can make suggestions, <clears throat> um, but you cannot, you should not be rewriting. I don't think, I mean, for nonfiction, yes, that's different, but for fiction, you should not be rewriting an author's work. Um, you learn to ask a lot of questions. If there's something you're not, if you, reading things aloud help, helps too. And sometimes I'll say to the author, can you read this sentence aloud? It doesn't work. <clears throat> you need another pause. You need a stronger pause. You need something more than a comma. You need a co semicolon or a dash or something. You know, I mean, I, when I'm editing, I sometimes, um, I mean, I sometimes do punctuation. I mean, if I notice it, you know, in certain places you kind of need a comma after an end, no, before, well, there, there was, I'm not talking about the, I believe in the Oxford comma, but that's different. But sometimes um, there's a pause that's a natural pause because of the word. If you read it aloud, you can tell that you don't need a comma. But if, if you're confused, if, <clears throat> if the word sep, this is complicated and I, mean, I don't even know if you're gonna understand what I'm talking about. <laughs> I mean, I'm picturing it now. Um, if there's a sentence and the word bridging the two phrases could be misinterpreted to, to mean one other thing, then you need to put a more of a pause or something to, to so the reader understands where the pause comes. Mm. That makes sense. That oh, makes perfect sense. <laughs> uh, but that's something I learned. I mean, that's something I learned over time and to learn to read aloud if I'm not sure of a sentence making sense or, or not sure where the pauses should be, the commas or the the other punctuation marks should be, you know. And sometimes, uh, you know, so there are a whole bunch of different things you pay attention to while you're reading. When I'm reading um, for the first time, I try not to make notes unless something jumps out at me. If I have a submission, I'll read the submission and try to just hopefully just get involved in it. <clears throat> Although if I notice something off, I'll take make a note. And then it's on the second read. Um, unless I love something right away, I may not commit to taking it immediately and I want to reread it and on the reread I might make notes yeah when I buy something um <clears throat> I'll make notes and I'll edit as I reread but that won't be the final line edit I mean that's just I may ask for big edits or small edits you know I just notice something here doesn't work something here does work um but I always do a final line edit, what I call the line, the actual line edit is like a, after I buy a story, months later, hopefully, if I have enough time between the publication and everything, a few months later, I let it sit and then I'll go back to the story and line edit it. Hmm. <clears throat> and then, you know, to see it kind of fresh, but then again, it's hard, you have to really focus on the line edit and not let yourself get caught in the plot. Because at that point, you're supposed to be beyond that part. You know, you're trying to get the language right and the rhythm right and the phraseology and everything. I really like the suggestion part. Kind of uh, when it comes to fiction, it, it, it's, I've heard that from other people too, where you shouldn't be like definitive or rewrite. Unless there's story. something so obviously wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that happens, you know, once in a while that's happened where the author has been really adamant about not changing something. And it's like, it doesn't make sense if you don't change it without that. And I'll just, mm. I mean, that happened once with someone and I just changed it anyway. <laughs> they never noticed, but it's like, this makes no sense if you don't have a comma here. I mean, it was a comma thing. It was like, I was like, oh. no. But um, yeah, I try to be respectful of an author's work, of a writer's work, you know? I also like, but, um when sorry Brennan I also like when uh I get beta readers that say I like this or I like that not because of the compliment but 
because in my mind, I'm like, all right, that works. What else could work similar to that in different sentences? Brennan, your turn. Yeah, no, I was, I was going to say, um, you know, you already touched on a few of these, but if you are an author doing your last pass before it gets sent off uh, to an editor like you, or I, I suppose any editor, what are some of the most common things that authors need to look at a little harder on that last pass? Repeating words and phrases. Because I'll, with the computer, it's if a word or phrase starts jumping out at me, I'll look for, I'll do a search for place and find a hundred that's in a 20 page story. And I'll say, you have a hundred that's, get rid of most of them. Well, get rid of half of them or whatever. Although, I feel like you're talking directly to me. <laughs> <laughs> the words that though sometimes are important and if a right so I want to go over them. I always make say to the writer, I have to see what you've done. I need it either in red or you have to do track changes because you know it used to be you'd have print out, you can compare the things in print. I'm not printing things out. I said you have to tell me what you've changed because sometimes someone will take a that out and it was actually I would think it's necessary. But I call those the authorial ticks. <laughs> you know, there were still um, I mean there are a lot of words just they're placeholders, you know, and you can write a much more active sentence without them, hmm. changing it around, deleting them, whatever. So that's what I would look for the last pass before sending it out. What about passive voice? Is that an issue? Only what if I notice it. <laughs> if I notice it, it's, it's, it's an issue. That's how I feel about most things that I don't like. <laughs> yeah, if I don't notice it, I guess it's fine. <laughs> That's, that's actually a really good observation is that if it's, it, you know, if it's not distracting, then it's not a problem. Um, if it I doesn't take about, you out of the story. That's actually how I feel about experimental fiction. I hate it unless I don't notice it. <laughs> and I've read some wonderful things that I realized, oh, it's experimental, blah, blah, blah. But I didn't notice it. That's good. <laughs> I'd like to jump to an anthology if you're able to talk about it. The Shirley Jackson theme sounds incredibly interesting. I hope so. <laughs> you know, I haven't heard back from my editor yet. It makes me nervous. I sent in a manuscript a week ago or so. Can you tell us anything about it? Well, it's a mix. It's a real mix of stories. I mean, there are things that are eerie and weird and uncanny and dark. And um, one of my favorite stories is Laird Barron's is totally vicious and a friend and I'm a, and it's it may be I'm, it may be the most over the top Shirley Jackson story. I mean it's not graphic or anything really, but it's um, it's really disturbing and I love it. You know, um, I mean I like I love all the stories, but that one jumps out at me because it's almost not like her. The stories are really varied. You know, I've got some really good writers. Um, and let me think of who I have. Uh, Paul, Paul Tremblay, um, Mary Rickert, Kelly Link. I have a terrific story by Kelly Link. Liz Hand, I have a story. Shauna McGuire, hmm. Carmen Maria Machado, Cassandra Kaur, John Langan, Karen Euler, Benjamin Percy, Josh Mallerman, Joyce Carol Oates, Richard Cadry, Paul Tremblay, Stephen Graham Jones, Jeff Ford, Gemma Files, Genevieve Valentine, Laird Barron, and Kelly Link. That's so yeah, awesome. that's who's in it. So it's really varied stories. And for once, John Langan is only like 1,200 words. Like I was shocked. It's like, oh my God. And it's good. <laughs> what about the yeah. Joyce Carol Oates one? Yeah. Um, it's there. I, I really like them. It's an interesting mix. You know? Yeah. Joyce is great. I mean, it, either she has an idea, she'll say yes, and she'll write it immediately, or she won't. Um, sometimes she'll write them too fast, and it's like, I haven't sold the book yet. <laughs> So I make sure I don't ask her until I've sold the book. Because when she did send me a story and I couldn't, and I never, I said, I haven't sold the anthology, you better you know, do something with it. I can't, I'm really sorry. And so now I make sure at least I can, you know, I have a book to put her in. Uh, yeah, absolutely so important. It'll be coming out this fall. I mean, it's coming out in like September. Yeah, so, and I saw um, a rough of the cover that I really like. And they're going to announce it at some point, you know, PR thing with the table of contents and the cover. Mm -hmm. So hopefully in the next few weeks. Oh, okay. Well, I'm yeah. I'm excited about that. that one in the body horror one. It sounds very interesting. I'm, I'm looking towards that. I saw Ray Cluley posted that uh, a 
week ago, something like that. So yeah, um, that's also in September. I have three books coming out this year. That <clears throat> that and hopefully the best of the year, number thirteen. That's impressive, uh, Brennan. Anything before we start jumping into the reading question? Well, I was going to ask. Um, you know, obviously the year's best horror aside, when you're looking to put together an anthology, what's your process for selecting a theme? Something that I think I could live with for two years, <laughs> and something that will sell to a publisher, both in the combination. <clears throat> if it's not a subject that I could live with, I, you know, I'm going to be living with it for two to three years, you know, from the time I pitch it to the time it comes out, and um, so it has to be something that interests me, you know. Hmm. Uh, <clears throat> and basically, that's it, you know. And I mean, I love to do non-theme anthologies, but they're much harder to sell. Um, and what no. was the other point? I'm sorry. What was the other part of that question? Um, no, I think that was. Just, I think it was just a single part question. I'm now. I'm now doubting myself, but I think it was just. A, you know, how do you go about selecting a theme? And, and I kind of liked your initial answer. Something I can live with. Basically, yeah, <clears throat> yeah. I mean, it, I mean, I've had my agent has su suggested things. I was like, Ugh. it's like I don't have any interest in that. I, I didn't wouldn't want to. Yeah. Well, it's 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 a little bit like you know, tell the story that you want to read. If if somebody tells you what your book is going to be about, you're not going to want to spend six months writing it. Just like if somebody, you know, gives you a theme that you're not wild about, well, why I have, are you? <laughs> I have had publishers suggest themes. I mean, the thing about the Jackson is really interesting because I had actually initially started thinking about doing a Jackson anthology several months before at ReaderCon. There was a discussion about. Um, Jackson because of the Jackson Awards and I actually considered doing an anthology on Jackson but I didn't want to deal I thought oh but I have to contact her family you know to make sure it's okay and it's like oh god it's too much trouble and it was busy so I didn't do anything and then like six months later or even less maybe four months later I met the who, the guy who became my editor at Titan in Dublin at a party and I was trying to pitch him something I said can I pitch you here you know it's like a party so like, yeah sure so we talked about doing an anthology together and talk around and around and around and around. And finally, they didn't like any of the ideas. And so how about a Charlie Jackson one? I said, okay. And I didn't tell them that I had already been thinking about it for four months before because I never did anything with it. You know, and I've had a Lovecraft Unbound. Um, that was Rob Simpson's, well, my title, but Rob Simpson who had been at DC and then was at Black Dark Horse. Um, he commissioned that and it was his idea, but I came up with the title. <clears throat> so sometimes, you know, publishers do come up with the idea and I'll say, I, oh yeah, I really like that. Hmm. I think, I, I can't remember, but Solaris might have come up with the Poe thing because of the Bicentennial at the time. You know, and I said, yeah, I'd love to do a Poe anthology. <laughs> Who is your favorite author? I don't have one. I have many favorite authors. That's a good answer. It's true. It's like choosing your favorite child, for Christ's sake. Just like my child. I have well, I have favorite, sometimes people say, what are my favorite anthologies that I've edited? And I do have some favorites, only because I like the theme a lot, or I like, I think there are more stories in it that I like. So that's a little different, but favorite authors, no. I have many. I don't know what mine, I mean, I yeah. I would say group, but I, yeah, that's that's a silly question. So, uh, well, you know, I was going to say, I, I always try when we're, when we're writing notes, when we're, you know, we're doing research and thinking about what we want to ask people we're going to talk to. I never want to ask somebody what their favorite anthology or what their, fa it just seems like such a mean question. <laughs> well, I mean, different favorites at different times. Yep. The anthologies that I've worked on. I'll never ask that question again. <laughs> Just don't ask my favorite writer. That's terrible. <laughs> it's putting an editor on the spot anyway. That's know? true. Wow. Oh, mm. Someone says my favorite writer. You know? I was, I, I was thinking all the rest of you. <laughs> yeah, that's, you know what? I was thinking more of like Poe or Lovecraft I mean, or Jackson. Dead ones. dead ones. I don't have any dead ones either. <laughs> favorite ones. I mean, I have some that I loved. I mean, I liked, um, it's more the work than the, the writer. I mean, mm -hmm. I love certain works by certain writers, but not everything. I love The Man Who Was Thursday by Jack, 
uh, Chesterton. Mm -hmm. And I never realized, for the first like three times I read it, I didn't even realize, oh, it's about God, who cares? You know, I like to a great novel. <laughs> it's like, oh, I'm not in that. I love, um, I love the Magus, although I haven't read it. I don't know if it would hold up 30 years later, but I loved it when I read it by John Fowles. Um, I love Ted Whittemore as the um, Jerusalem Quartet and um, Queen's Shanghai Circus. I, I loved Geek Love by Catherine Dunn. I mean, there are novels I've loved mm -hmm. by people, but you know, usually I don't love all their work. Jonathan Carroll's most of his books I love, most of his novels, you know, Gibson, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you know, there are different works of people that I love. That's rather than the a writer. great answer. Yeah, I, I totally get that. Now, you kind of already told us, one of our closing out uh, questions is, what are you reading? You kind of already oh, told us that, but... Aside from what I have to read, my year's best. Um, I'm reading, actually, I can't remember my name. I'm reading a novel called Wonderland. I'll have to look up her name. Sorry, hang on a second. Not a problem. It's a really strange name. And it's. I think it's dark. It's dark. Um, I mean, yeah. I'm not sure yet, but it's dark. Hold on a second. I know exactly what you're talking about. I could spell it, but I can't say it. Soji or something. I mean, it's a very strange yeah. name. Hold on. It's... Hold on, I have it here. I have my check-in list and check-out list. Wonderland. Where Zo I don't even know how to pronounce it. Z-O-J-E stage. Ostage. Uh, I mean, I have no idea how to pronounce or spell it. It's S O. I'm sorry, Z O J E, spelled stage is the second name. Uh, and it's Wonderland, and it's so far I'm about halfway through, and I'm liking it. <clears throat> I did, it's the kind of thing I would think I'd hate about mm -hmm. a family who goes moves out of the city and goes to the woods, and it's um, they're snowbound, and it's really weird stuff going on. <laughs> um, I don't know if I'm going to like where it's going, and I'm not sure if I'm going to love it, but I'm enjoying it so far. Enough to keep reading, let's put it that way. That's, that's <laughs> definitely good. Anything that's, else? That's very good, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I just finished, uh, before that, I read Elizabeth Hand's um, Book of Lamps and Banners, which I love to cast near you. Um, I'm reading, I'm reading like five different anthologies. I'm trying to get through them. I have to pick, I have my books due in a week. Oh my goodness. Uh, yeah, in eight days it's due. So, and I've only picked like 40,000 words so far. So, and I want to read a lot. I have stories I have to reread to choose, but I really want to get through the books I haven't read yet, at least skim them to see if there's <laughs> anything in them that I want to take and write them up. <laughs> wow, uh, that's pressure. <laughs> first off i'd like to say thank you for uh giving us some time on a sunday night when you're oh, yeah. doing eight days that's uh <laughs> that's an honor <laughs> um and also you know it wouldn't be uh i don't think we've ever made it through an episode without having to offer some kind of blanket apology for messing up somebody's name oh, it's no, just it's, no it's all right you didn't do anything it's fine yeah um let's see um I am reading In Nightmares We're Alone by Greg Sisko. It's out from uh, Samantha Koyesnik's Off Limits Press. And I'm about two thirds of the way through. It's actually three kind of uh, linking novellas. Mm -hmm. um, they they kind of follow one big story, but just from, uh, well, so far, two different points of view. I have no idea what's in store for me with novella three yet, but it, it's good. Um, he is really excellent at making the reader anxious and uncomfortable. Um, and, it, and it's one of like the stories, the story's good, uh, but the immersive writing is real, real good. Um, so I, I, I can't wait to see how that one wraps up. Patrick, how about you? I'd also like to mention a couple of things that I've worked on for Twitter. Sure. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm just out as Burning Girls and Other Stories um, by Veronica Shanos, who is a friend of mine. I was looking at it. I think I put her book someplace away. It's got a great cover, and it's a collection. It's the first collection of short stories, and it's got some real horrific stories in it, but not traditionally horrific. Um, most of them were published before, and they're really good. You know, <clears throat> they're, um, they're Jewish, feminist, socialist, very political, um, fairy tales i mean it's really good stuff in there and um cassandra coy's nothing but black and teeth is coming out i forget when exactly i think september that's from nightfire and that's a novella i acquired for them and that's got a great cover oh you got to see the cover on that look it up 
I mean, it's really freaky. It is totally creepy about some young people going to a, a haunted mansion in Japan for a wedding party and bad things happen. <laughs> well, uh, what's, the t- what's the title? That Nothing sounds really cool. Black and Teeth. The cover is yeah. terrific. If, I don't know if you can post it up here or anything, but you should. Yeah. It's, and I've I've seen a couple people who got like early net, net galley copies of, of that or whatever, and they everything I've seen about it so far has been very positive. Oh, I have seen that cover. Yeah, that's pretty damn cool. That's creepy. Yeah, it's a really good, <laughs> creepy cover. Wow. Yeah, Japanese horror. They I, actually loads of Asian horror. I like Korean horror myself, but um, they. They nail it. They nail the creep and dread factor for sure. Yeah, well, it's a bunch of friends who are all different, mostly Asian. Mm-hmm. There's one American too, but mostly they're um, Asian. <clears throat> they're different nas- ethnic groups, you know, people, a bunch of friends from college, I guess. They go to this, they're going to a wedding party in this Japanese haunted mansion that's pretty awful. <laughs> and their relationships are pretty awful too. I want to read that and it's got a very nice blur by uh paul tremblay sharp playful and nasty as hell so i'm reading i just started greg cisco's book too about uh five only five percent in yeah five percent in even um what's the title it is i don't want to butcher it uh in nightmares we're alone through samantha koyaznik's uh press uh off limits press it came out this year? It comes out, well, it's a reissue. It comes out um, next, uh, two, Mondays, two Mondays for all? Yeah, the 15th, the 15th of May. When did it originally get published? 2015. Uh, I, I don't know who it came out with or if it was self-published, but it was uh, I don't 2015 know. was the original date. Right. And uh, the one that I just finished up was uh, Ronald Kelly's it's another reissue. Ronald Kelly's Undertaker's Moon, a uh, werewolf story involving an Irish family that moves to Tennessee. It's really fun. Um, they did. He did. He did something with a werewolf story that I haven't seen uh, in really any other stories. And it was very Mongols? gross. You must have read Mongols by Stephen Graham Jones. I haven't. All the Good really Indians good. was the first yeah. Stephen Graham Jones. It's a really good novel. It's a really good werewolf novel. I yeah. want to read everything that guy writes. <laughs> Mo- Mongrels was my first experience reading him and still my favorite um it's really lovely yeah it's it's a great book and if you if you like you know werewolf literature it's i it's it's you can't not read that one um it's it's absolutely vital to the subgenre. i've only heard very very glowing reviews from pretty much everything he puts out he's one of those authors mm-hmm. sorry Oh, that's fine. I was just gonna say it's one of those authors where he, he keeps knocking it out of the park. Yeah, yeah. I acquired Night of the Mannequins and edited that, which is mm. which is which is a really weird teenage slasher novella. <laughs> yeah, Brandon, you told me about that. Uh, yeah, story yeah. That. I got to I got to read that one last year. I think that came out that come out end of summer. Am I making that up? <laughs> um, no, it. It actually came out a couple of months after it was supposed to because of um, because the only the only good Indian came out that was was bounced was bumped later so ours novella was bumped later I don't remember exactly when it came out yeah it it was a cool book though yeah I enjoyed that one yeah it's fun I mean it's I want to read his new one. My was it? My heart is a chainsaw. Yeah, I have yeah. A but I can't look at it until I finish reading for this year. <laughs> <laughs> now, where where can people follow you? Uh, Twitter and Facebook. I have a we- I have a website that I never look at. <laughs> if they can reach me, they can get me through that though. But I'm on Twitter under my name, you know, Ellen Datlow, and Facebook mostly. And uh, do you have any final thoughts? Or any final comments or any final anything? Nah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> what about you, Brennan? Nah, I'm going to go with that. <laughs> oh, okay. I, know, I didn't know if you were serious. I am. <laughs> All right. So, uh, <laughs> do, do you? Well, I was just going to remind everybody that uh, <laughs> you can check out uh, 
the contest for Cena Palayo. By the way, Cena, I told her that we were doing an advertising for a giveaway, and she was uh, very thrilled. She said, "I love Ellen. She is a legend." So figured you'd like to hear that. But uh, we're doing a book giveaway thanks to Cena. She is um, offering a co- one copy hardcover of her now uh, out book called Children of Chicago. Uh, just go on our Twitter. You have three days to enter. Very easy, two or three steps to uh, get your name in in that uh, giveaway. Um, Ellen, I appreciate what you're doing, the hard work. It, it, it's very influential for especially a newer guy like myself. Um, and I appreciate you offering your time for talking to me and Brennan about all this. So thank you. Thank you. Brennan, it's always a pleasure talking to you, sir. And before we go, what is... Uh, on your hat oh uh what is on my hat oh i'm wearing my uh black hills <laughs> my black hills press hat from uh shane hawk's um is his, it a his buffalo? imprint is it, it a is buffalo? it's a buffalo i'm gonna try and get close here i don't know yeah. where my camera is okay. yes. and it's got kind of a mountain range built in okay. uh shane hawk is an indigenous horror author uh from i believe it, it's the uh cheyenne and arapaho tribe um is and San this Diego. is his yeah, this is his imprint um, for his for his books, and Shane will be on the show in a couple of weeks. Listeners, thank you for staying with us throughout all this. Uh, and next week we will have another great guest. So appreciate your time, Ellen. Thanks again, Brennan. Thank you, sir. As always. <laughs>